to people. Oh, I should mention again that um, we're going to record this session and it's majorly because, you know, um, we want to be able to watch and learn even after now. It's easy for us to forget after now, like maybe in under two months, but you can always go on YouTube and watch again. Again, this is the first event organized by FON Germany in 2024. And today we're learning about having an effective finance plan for the year. And um, we were just saying, put in the chat, a description about the city you're in, and a lot of people will guess. Um, Iberi, can you speak? Can you guess the city with the largest shipyard in Europe? Wow. Wow. <laughs> now this is getting interesting. <laughs> Iberi, can you speak? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you know the city yeah. with the largest shipyard in Europe? Yeah, Hamburg. The shipyard, I think, is called Speicher So, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. Now yeah. I'm even confused myself. <laughs> okay, let's go. Patricia. <laughs> no, Sergo, no. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is a very fun fact. I will never forget this after this meeting. Okay, city with the largest shipyard in Europe. Google, where are you? Hmm. Where in Italy? This is cheating, cheating, point blank cheating. Buki, please, we don't want this cheating. You want to tell us you are in Nigeria? No. Where in Italy? What's the city with the largest shipyard in Europe? Nobody is getting this right. Okay. Well. <laughs> ah. Ah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I knew it. Since Chama did not put on a camera, I knew something was going on. Chama, what are you drinking? <laughs> a Papa Lagos, really? <laughs> okay, great. Not to waste too much time. We need to answer this question. We need to answer this question. Patricia, where are you from? Give us the answer. Sanaza. Krista had used France. Yeah, I've used Google. Although um, I know Shegun would have gotten it, so I put the place I work. So, <laughs> because he knows okay. where I live, so I put where I work. So, um, the play, the city with the largest shipyard in Europe is San Azar. Wow, I'm pretty sure I will not forget that. That's that's <laughs> another learning. See, we came here to learn about finance, we're learning about the city with the, with the largest shipyard in Europe. Really, you cannot be a part of this community and not learn something new. I tell you that. I tell you that. Anyway, let's just move straight ahead to what we have um, scheduled for today. Like I said, welcome again to the first event organized by FON Germany. And um, today we're going to be learning from our speaker how to have an effective financial plan for 2024. So I'm going to move aside and just call on my Olga in Germany, Shagun Kadri, to introduce the speaker. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, you're all welcome to this event. Uh, like also has been said by our anchor, um, this is our first event for 2024. And it's such a delight to have you here and to have you join us. Uh, so we want to just give a brief introduction about our speaker, uh, Patricia is yeah i've known Pat i've known patricia now for yeah getting close to <laughs> five years uh yeah yeah surprisingly and um patricia is also she is a personal finance coach uh, let me get a profile and um, read the profile in the accurate word so patricia is a financial coach and a personal finance expert uh, she has been coaching for the past 10 years with success stories all over the world. Yeah, different uh, people that she's coached. Uh, apart from the fact that, yes, we worked together briefly on uh, FON uh, in FON France and worked in the business committee, which also I'm also one of our products. <laughs> yeah, she develops tools that are not only easy to use, but creates an avenue to have a more intimate relationship with one's personal 
uh, finance. Then aside the things that she does on personal finance, she's also an engineer. I think a structural engineer, um, if I'm not mistaken. And she right. also really serves as a project manager within the renewable energy sector. It's a privilege for us to have you, uh, Patricia, join this conversation and to help us facilitate this session. And uh, with that, uh, we are going to uh, hand over to Patricia so that she can uh, lead us on. And then afterwards, we will take questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining this session today. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you and have this interaction with you. Um, I know personal finance is very personal for everyone and is a topic that we don't learn in school, we don't learn anywhere. We just you know, get into life and we start seeing bills, we start seeing things and are trying to figure out how to you know, master the art of our own finances. And it's also, you know, noteworthy that everyone wants to invest, everybody wants to build for the future, but nobody seems to have the roadmap as to how we can start or what we can do or how we can, first of all, master what we have and then see how we can, you know, multiply that. Now, this session today, just to be clear, is not necessarily about investment, although I'll touch, you know, some topics on that as most of us, I, I assume, are immigrants to different countries. So I would just maybe stir you in the direction where you would be able to see maybe how you can do further research in the different countries that you live in on how to optimize your finances. So I'll share my screen and we can, we can start. Uh, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the topic of today is having an effective personal finance for 2024. I'm sure, I'm, I'm very sure all of us at some point in time have heard about budgeting or, you know, a lot of buzzwords about investing or, you know, mastering your financial independence number, or all those different buzzwords. And I'm sure this is not the first time most of us have come in contact with, um, you know, personal finance, because we, we, we have our finances, we pay our bills, we receive salary. So we're already doing it. The purpose of this meeting is that at the end, we would have like a roadmap or an idea of how we can manage our finances better so that we can create the opportunities that we can use to invest or create the opportunities to move from where we are currently to maybe a better level before we begin to invest. So I hope at the end of this talk, we would be able to take something out of it and we'll be able to implement it because one thing is hearing, the other thing is implementation and that's the more difficult part. So I would start. Now, I remember where I just did like a quick agenda of how the, the presentation and how this discussion would go. So one book that greatly influenced my decision to be more intentional about my personal finance was The Richest Man in Babylon. And I'm going to draw from that book a lot, um, a lot of things that you know, would help us understand how we today can manage our own finances. Then we would you know, talk about you know, general things regarding personal finance, um, budgeting, our goals, and also of course, question and answer at the end of this discussion. So the first thing is, when I read this book, I took three things, first of all, from it. The first thing is that desire wealth. What does that mean? It, when you are broke, all you are thinking about is, I want to eat food, I want to put food on my table, and that's it. You're not thinking long term, you're not thinking bigger, you're just thinking about, let me put food on my table. But when you desire wealth, it is beyond your current state is beyond where you are currently, even though um, money might be tight or something, because I'm sure most of us have been there, I've been there, and you are just focused on day to day. But if you are able to desire beyond your current state to say, okay, I want to be able to be financially free at age 60, meaning I want to be able to provide for my basic needs and maybe luxuries at this age. And then you do like a regression like okay how can i be able to achieve this 
So when you desire wealth is to be able to say, what do I see myself owning or having that would make my life more full and not worry about finances? The next thing is to seek knowledge. Now, a lot of us, maybe we listen to podcasts, we've listened to a lot of things, and maybe we we'll just listen to it in passing without, you know, absorbing it. Reading books on finances or, you know, listening to people who have experience in finances can help us build our knowledge base so that we ourselves can be able to implement what we've heard into our lives. For example, let's say you want to learn how to cook. If you are just watching cooking channels and you are not implementing those knowledge, you don't know how to cook. You may think you know how to cook, but you really don't know how to cook. But if you are able to take that knowledge and you're able to every day, maybe boil water, boil egg, and you succeed in that, next day you would improve. I'll give you an example simply. Last year, my husband uh, wanted to do a um, celebration for an achievement that he had in, in his um, place of work. So he ordered for some meat pie from somebody and the meat pie was trash. So <laughs> I was not very happy and I was like, okay, I think I, I can be able to seek knowledge from YouTube and I think I can do better than this. And one year later, uh, everybody that I've made meat pie for has told me it's the best they've ever had in their life. So it means that there is, when you seek knowledge and you take action, so I'm mixing, I'm bringing these two together, you would not only, um, improve you know the knowledge base but also you you can be able to use that knowledge to bring more wealth and more things to yourself so today if i want to open a meat pie factory i have my recipe and i have things that i know will satisfy my customer so that's a skill that i've included to my life just because i sought knowledge and i took action so today i implore you to desire wealth to seek knowledge and to take action from what we are going to learn today Another other lessons that we learned from here is I'm sure we've heard this before, but I would know I would ask you to put something in the chat, and we will know whether you have been following what you heard previously or what you're learning today, and how you are going to move forward with that. So the first thing is that you should live on less than you make. Now we know these things. We we know okay if we live on less than you make, you have margin to save, and then you can save that money. However, how many of us really do that? Also, we need to seek advice from those who are competent through their own experience. Now, somebody who has been able to save and maybe invest and build an emergency fund and all that, we can give you the roadmap to how they achieved it. Now, you may not be able to adapt it particularly because your situation might be different, but seeking advice from someone that has already done it would give you like a concrete way of doing it for yourself. And then the third thing is to make money work for you. So through investments, through owning your own business, those are avenues through which you can make money work for you and, you know, build wealth. So observe these, you know, desire, observe these laws. So the laws is desire wealth and you should seek knowledge and you should take action. And of course, you should always, always, always be a student. So always study different books, and you know different avenue of attaining uh, of obtaining knowledge that would help you expand your mind and change your mindset regarding things i, I remember when i i came to france I i'll just give you a quick example i came to france and i was saving i already always already built the habit of saving from when i was in nigeria so saving the saving part of it was already covered but I didn't know emergency funds. I didn't know how to, you know, allocate the savings and how to, you know, apportion it so that I would know what to invest and where to invest. So I sat down, analyzed where I lived and was able to come up with a way that I could invest passively because I knew that I, I, I couldn't actively invest. Like in real estate, you would actively invest because you are going to change a lot of things. I and mean, even when you have tenants, things are breaking up here and there, you would actively be involved. So at that time, I really was seeking for something passive, not necessarily something that will be entering my account every month, but something that will grow that I can use for retirement. And I was able to get that knowledge and apply it. And today, I would say my investment has grown very, very well. The next thing is uh, building a spending plan. So... When we hear about spending plan or budget, uh, I don't know. Can you if can you put in the chat when you hear budget or you know 
what comes to mind? Like, is it what what do you think a budget is? I know most of us know what a budget is, but what kind of emotions is triggered in your heart when you hear the word budget? Please, can you like just write maybe like one sentence? Like, I don't know, happiness, fear, <laughs> excitement. What does budget like when you hear the word budget? When tell somebody say budget your finances, what does that mean to you? So you can write in the chat and. I would see what all of us think budget a budget you know is. So I would just just look at it um, quickly and okay I've seen planning I've seen discipline focus plan for spending we are all correct to be honest. But for me I remember when I didn't really understand what budgeting was it the kind of emotion that comes to my mind was fear. Because I'm like, am I going to restrict myself? Like, because when I hear budget, it's like, ah, am I going to now start, you know, restricting all the things I'm spending? Am I going to just be squeezing everything out from everywhere? And that was a totally wrong mindset. That is because a budget is just you, assign, just making sure that you're assigning money where you want it to go. That is it. You want your money to go here. You want to see that your money, you are getting full value for that money. It doesn't mean that you will not have leisure activities. It will be part of your budget. It, does, it doesn't mean that you cannot, if you are a traveler, you want to be traveling at least once a year or twice a year abroad, you can factor that into your budget. Depending, of course, on what you earn and how you can play around with all the different elements on your budget sheet. But it doesn't mean that you are going to restrict yourself because that was the initial um, thing I had many years ago that, oh my God, I'm going to. So it was really scary for me to go into it and really analyze what my habits were. And also another thing that I would say was scary too was to like sort of be introspective and like sort of um, examine myself and my spending habits. It was very scary to me. But then again, it's something that is worthwhile to do in order for you to know how you're spending money. Yeah, your money, because even if you don't plan, your money is going somewhere. So why not just direct the money to go where you want it to go, even if it is in traveling? At least you know where it is going. And then when you have your goal, you know how you're going to fashion your budget to be able to achieve the goals that you have in life. So enjoy delayed gratification until financial freedom is rich. Now, this is there's a caveat here. It doesn't mean that you will never enjoy any pleasures of life till you attain financial freedoms. No, it just means that you would not, for instance, you will not be buying an iPhone every year, for instance. Like if you have an iPhone 11 that is still functioning properly this year, and you can say, okay, I'm not going to be fall for the trap to be buying an iPhone every year. I can buy once every five years. So Yes, enjoy delayed gratification, not necessarily until financial freedom. Once in a while, you can treat yourself because we are human beings and we have emotions. And we sometimes when you restrict yourself too much, you may overspend when you give yourself the liberty to do so. Um, seek advice from those competent. I think I've already mentioned that before. Learn to make money work for you. So this is the investment part of it. We will talk briefly about it at the end of this presentation. Invest your income in something you understand or invest with someone with the right expertise. I'll give you an example on this. So I don't know if many of you heard about the craze when it was happening in Nigeria about a crowdfunding for agriculture. Please, how many of you have heard of this or how many of you invested in that? Just you know, say yes or no, and we will know, you know, if you were are conversant with this with this topic. So on the in the chat, you can write yes or no if you knew about the uh, crowd events or investment opportunities in the agricultural space. Yes. So yes, I too heard of it and I, I pride myself on being very diligent in what I'm spending my money on. So I, you know, when it came out, I was very prudent. I followed, I did my due diligence. I thought um, I saw a lot of them with farms and, you know, it was it, like I could see a, like I, I could see re the real thing behind it. For instance, for agro partnership, they had like the, in Edo State, Edo State gov governor, I'm from Edo State, the Edo State governor was even there to open their palm oil, you know, plantation. So in my mind, I felt, you know, it was a legit thing because it's not like a MMM where you don't know where the money is being invested. Here, we were seeing like physical things. They talked about their value chain, how they 
you know, in, in from agriculture in, in Nigeria, they export to Switzerland, they export to Germany. It sounded very good on paper, right? However, I lost a lot of money to that. You see, that is because sometimes when you, you think you did your due diligence, you maybe you don't understand, maybe I didn't understand everything, but I convinced myself that it was it was a true good investment, right? Because I had seen the Edo State governor, I had seen people that, you know, were tr quote unquote trustworthy being attached to these businesses. And today, um, a lot of people lost their money to that. So invest your income in something you understand so if you are going to invest in anything, if it's a business you want to do, you are the one running your business, you know, and you understand your business. So that can be a way of investing to make sure that even if you lose money, you know, it's your, it's, you learn a lesson from it, from your business, and you're able to open another business with a lesson learned from that previous business. Invest the profits end in order to enjoy compound interest. So... For instance, let's say you invested in the stock market and you get dividend. Instead of spending that money, you know, in, I don't know, other things, you may decide to reinvest that money. And then your money keeps growing exponentially in that way because every time you are putting more money into it and your money is growing through compound interest. And then just to, you know, finish this um, particular slide, I'm sure most of us have heard this slogan, pay yourself first. It actually came from this book. So this pay yourself first is a, is a budgeting type that, you know, people, you know, take a particular percentage of their money and put aside for savings, and then they are free to spend the rest. This is for, these are for people that are not really interested in numbers or they have enough money that they are earning to be sure that when they remove something, it is not going to affect at least their mandatory expenses. So we'll move. <clears throat> so generally, Use the lessons from losses to gain experience on how not to make the same mistake in the future. Now, I will use my lessons from um, the agriculture business to know that if I want to do agriculture, let it be that I'm opening my own farm. You see, if I'm interested in agriculture or the story behind it. So you use it's not that you're not going to ever have losses in life. That is not realistic. But when you have those losses, don't dwell, don't dwell on it. And I'll tell you why. For me, I'm smiling, not because I did, those losses were not painful, but I had a buffer that when I lost that money, it wasn't as if I put my life, my life's savings into, into this particular venture. Discipline is of the utmost importance. Now, this is the most, if, if you gain anything from this topic today, gain that you must be disciplined with your finances. Because a lot of us think that, oh, we just, you know, do the budget. But when you finish doing the budget, you are not following the budget. Then what's the point? There's no point. So the point is, do the budget, whatever budgeting style is okay for you. And stick to it. Make sure that you are tracking it. It's going to be tedious. But life is not built. It's not a bed of roses. You have to invest time in something that is important to you. And investing time in your finances is extremely important so being disciplined in following your budget being disciplined in upskilling yourself to earn more money being disciplined to doing that certification you wanted to do because to help you get a bigger pay somewhere which will increase your, your your the money that you can use to you know build more wealth so being disciplined is if there's anything you learn from today is your discipline now a lot of us struggle i myself in i, I include myself in this we all struggle with being disciplined or procrastinating or you know, but every single day, if you remind yourself, if you do a financial checkup and all that every month, you are able to now bring yourself back to that discipline place. I'll talk about financial checkup as we go. And be weary of a reasonable high ROI. It may be a scam. Case in point, <laughs> the, the um, agri, agri tech uh, businesses that the field agri tech businesses in Nigeria. So, you have to be weary of maybe somebody saying come and make 50% or 100% or something crazy from maybe from one from 100 uh, euros person instead you make 10,000 euros. You should know that that should be a scam. Um, do not buy what you cannot truly afford. Now, this is a no-brainer, right? And I know I'd listen to, I know because most of us are Nigerians, I would assume that we have similar upbringing and most of us are not like into, a lot of people may be, but I think, we are reasonable people here. We, we will not go and borrow money to do a wedding, for instance. We will do a wedding that is within our means and not the wedding that we will do 
that would deprive us from having a better life after the wedding, for example. Provide for your family properly. Now, this is the right thing to do. You don't want your children to be in a situation whereby they come into this world and you're unable to provide adequately for them because you have not properly planned or you have not properly upskilled yourself to be able to earn properly or you have not positioned yourself in the right way to earn enough money to provide for your family. Now, this next, two to this next topic is very touchy. Prepare a will. Now, this is especially for everyone, but mostly for people who are married or people who have kids, it's very important that you prepare a will, how you want your estate to be shared, how you want how you want everything to happen when you are gone. Because I, I have a few friends who have lost their husbands and the husbands didn't have any will. And sometimes they, they, they go through a lot of stress in, in, in just able, being able to um, assess the money or being able to, you know, get the money at all. And if as we are abroad, it's a bit different because here, if there's no will, the state is going to take hold of the money and they are going to tax it to the maximum. Now, if you are able to make a will and you're able to, you know, prepare your estate plan properly, when we, we are not immortal, all of us, one day we will be gone. But we want our loved ones to be well taken care of when we are no longer here. So it's something to have in mind. It's not anybody wishing anybody death. No, not at all. It is planning, anticipating to ensure that you are your family is well taken care of. God forbid, in the event that we are no more, even when we are older, you know, to ensure that if, if your wealth is distributed as you want it to be distributed. And then be a giver to the less fortunate. Now, there is a caveat to this. It doesn't mean that you will pack all your money and go and give to less fortunate. No, it means that you will put in your budget, you put in your budget, the giving you want to do, the donation you want to do should be part of your budget so that when you have capped that, you know that you cannot go beyond that if not to become detrimental to your own personal finance. So, so save a portion of, so in general, just to summarize, save a portion of your earnings, do a spending plan and stick to it. The, please emphasis on stick to it. Invest your money. So you would have to, be, you, this is not something you rely on somebody else. But you can get information, but you have to do your due diligence yourself so that you are convinced and you are sure and able to do the pros and cons on where you want to invest your money in, be it in the stock market or be it in your own business that you want to do or be it investing in some a new business that you think is, is viable, you have to make sure that you are sure of where you are going to, even though you may incur losses, but at least even when you incur, incur those losses, you are justified that you did your due, due diligence, but we don't pray to lose any money. Guard your investments from losses. So for instance, I remember when they say the stock market is going down and there are two mindsets. The first one is people that carry out their life savings and put into the stock market. Oh, it's, it's, it's going down, it's going down. They are rushing to sell. They are rushing to sell and they are selling. The thing is going on free fall down. People, they are selling all their assets. Why are there other people who have buffers? They have the emergency fund. They have things that are like, and they're investing for like a long term. So when the money is free for, they see it as an opportunity to enter the market because they know that they are going to buy the stocks at you know, give away prices from people who did not plan properly before they invested. So guard your investment from losses. Buy home or invest in properties. Now, this is a no-brainer. Uh, we can talk about that during the investment, the, the brief moment I'll spend on the investment part. Save for retirement. Hmm. We will not be young forever, you see? We will not be young forever. We will not be strong forever to be able to work hard for our daily bread. So being able to save for your retirement is so important. And I'm sure most of us know this. But saving for your retirement is not only relying for Nigeria on your pension fund. No, because Nigeria for, Naira is on a free fall right now. Six million Naira is nothing when you compare it to euros or what it can actually achieve for you. And even when you're in, in, in Europe, you are contributing to the social security, but at the end of the day, you may not be able to get a huge amount. So you on your own have to ensure that you are investing something for your retirement. So when you get to that age, you will not become a liability to your children and continue to seek knowledge and improve your money building skills. So continue to read books, continue to come to webinars like this, continue, continue to interact with you know, your peers regarding um, you know, money and money habits and being accountable 
for one another to ensure that you continue to grow wealth as you should. So this is like the summary for, for a, a richest man in Babylon. I'm sure that maybe we have gotten some one or two nuggets from this. And my emphasis here, if you take anything from here, is discipline. So anything you are doing for 2024, whether you make a plan, if you make a plan and you don't stick to it, so it doesn't make any difference. Like you just did not do anything. But being disciplined to follow through, if it is a, a plan that you are doing, your budget or whatever, you have to follow through. You At the end of the year, when you look back, on your yearly review on your finances, you'll be proud of what you're able to save and maybe potentially invest. So now we move on to the second part of this place of this presentation, which is introduction to your personal finance. Now I don't know, I don't know if any of us uh, when we were in, in school we did home economics. Please, if you did anything on home economics, can you like write in the chat if you remember about home economics? Perfect, food and nutrition, good. <laughs> so everyone, <laughs> everyone did home economics. But the thing is that home economics is very crucial to your finances. So what family finances, so that is your budget, how you are locating your resources. How are you choosing where to buy things? For instance, here in this family, what we do is, I know that in June and July of every year, and in January, in France, there is sales. For clothing, for things, there is definitely sales. And children's clothing are very expensive. So what do I do? From January to June, every month, I am saving up some amount of money towards buying things cheaper in June, such that in June and in January, I'm getting winter and summer clothes for my kids at a giveaway price, 50% or sometimes 60% or sometimes, you know, for 10 euros or 7 euros, these same prices maybe I don't know, 30 euros. But because I have been able to study the way sales are done in France and I'm able to save towards that, I'm saving a huge amount of money because if I'm going to buy two, three clothes and each of them is 22 euros for, for one, and then I'm getting that cloth for 10 euros or I don't know, seven euros for one. And if I had planned my money properly, the savings is like I'm getting 50% of at all times. So that is part of family finance. On that thing, where do you buy your food? Now, I know I know Shegun knows this because he lived in France at some point. There is Super U and there is like all this drive, Super U drive. It is clear that when you go to drive to buy food, the prices there are more expensive than if you go to a regular store. If you go to Lidl or you go to Le, uh, Leclerc, Lidl is more cheaper than Leclerc. Now, knowing where to buy your things, you know, would give you a lot of savings within your, within your budget. Do you understand? It's not just about budgeting 250 euros for food, but optimizing that 250 euros by buying things. Now, most of us, we cook, so I am not even... Um, I don't think I need to preach about cooking and, you know, storing food in your freezer and making sure that you put that. I think all of us, we do. But knowing where to buy, like, for instance, here where we live, there's a man who supplies all the Nigerians and black people here food. You order for him from him rice, carton of chicken, carton of turkey, and it is the cheapest rather than going to buy from the store. So knowing those kind of things that can help you, excuse me, help you optimize your spending. So it's not just about putting a line item of food, 250 but how are you spending that 250 Are you getting the maximum that you can get from that 250 euros assigned to food? Are you going up beyond 250 because you are not buying, you are not optimizing that 250 that you have put towards food? Then we'll go to textile and maintenance. So if you buy good clothing and you know how to maintain them, let's say you buy linen or you buy cotton, you buy, and you have the proper knowledge on how to maintain this clothing, they will last you for a very long time, meaning that you will not have to replace your clothing too often if you buy classics or if your aesthetic is like classic dressing, a shirt, a normal black dress or white dress or something, not random colors, but you have like a, like a steady kind of a wardrobe that you use that is classic, that it doesn't change in trend, 
Then you can buy quality clothes, maintain them properly. They will last you a long time and you don't have to keep buying clothes so often that you have so many things in your closet and you have nothing to wear. So these, I'm just bringing home economics into here because it actually, it actually factors into how we spend our money on a daily basis and how we can be conscious. And, you know, like when you go to one store to the next, you would be able to say, oh, if I, I bought this thing cheaper here, so that means this place is more expensive. Just having that, co that consciousness would help you save a lot of money when you go out or when you are going to buy things on a daily basis. Then I will move on to this very important topic, the financial checkup. What is a financial checkup? Is go going through your finances with like a fine tooth comb to see where the loopholes are. Like we are not, nobody's a robot, even myself. Sometimes you think you are spending, you are good and everything, but truly you are not really at that level that you would want to be. So what I say is a financial checkup is regularly go through your bank statement to understand your spending habits. I remember like I think two or three months ago, I, I felt that we were spending so much money on food, even though like I, I was saving money. So I knew how much I was saving. But still, I felt in my mind that the money that we were, were um, spending for food was taken from other categories like miscellaneous, I was thinking. So I decided to go through my bank statement for that month and I was spending like 30% more on food than I, than I realized. And I thought to myself, is it like I need to increase this line item on my budget or am I wasteful? And I realized that I was legit wasteful. <laughs> A lot of food that I'm buying or randomly going to like expensive shop to buy random things. Just, oh, I remember I want to eat plantain and uh, fish today. And you just, instead of you to like plan it and say, okay, this man is going to bring cheaper fish for me. Okay, let me wait till next month. No, I want to eat it today. I can buy it expensive. And I saw that I was over, over my budget because I was not being conscious of what I was spending. So the fact that I went through my bank account gave me that reality check to say, oh, indeed, I'm spending too much money on this stuff and I should limit how much I'm spending. But then you can realize that, oh, I didn't put enough money in this category in my budget. So maybe I can expand that category and reduce another category so that I can be able to get the full benefit, of course, for my nutrition. Also, for instance, I'll give you another example if I go to the next point. I was um, subscribed to the Science Direct because I like to read, I like to get knowledge about engineering and things like that. And I wasn't reading, you know, any articles for like six months and I was paying for access to these um, resources. So I asked myself, am I going to, um, do I want to, do I have anything pressing I need to learn today that maybe I can get for free or something? And I, when I told my, myself no, so I had to unsubscribe from that and that freed up some money in my budget that maybe I could have used to go and get ice cream. At least I'm drinking ice cream. So going through your bank account gives you that opportunity to evaluate what you are truly spending so that you are not, you know, deceiving yourself in your mind that, oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Meanwhile, you're not really good because there are so many um, leaks in your spending habits. Then two, use point one above to build your first budget. So Usually, I tell people that when you are not really used to budgeting or sticking to budgets, it's good to start with the zero-sum budget. Now, it's more tedious to, to do, to be honest, because you have to go through each of your expenses, you have to allocate resources to it. It's tedious to do, to be honest. But it is at least once in your budgeting life, at least for a period, you should master your budget through a zero-sum budget. Except, of course, you are earning so much money, and we'll get to that when we're talking about the budgeting types. So eliminate any expenses that do not add 100% value for each Naira dollar or Euro that you spend. So I already explained to you at least using the Science Direct as an example. Monitor this budget for six months to know your true spending habits because maybe you may put, I don't know, 200 Euros on, I don't know, um, food. And then you truly, what you truly need is 300. So it means that you have to adjust that budget to suit what you really need to, because it's not like restricting, it's allocating what you need so that you are living a full life while you are making sure that you don't have any leaks. So that those money that you save from the leaks can go through to, and go towards your savings. Um, create a tracker to help track the progress of your financial goals. I will share that in the following slide, slides, uh, debt repayment and things like that. Evaluate your contribution to your retirement savings. I mean, mindful. 
so that you can rebalance your portfolio as needed. Um, ensure that you have the proper insurance coverage and ensure your estate, ensure you have your estate plan. So I already talked about estate plan. I talked about your will, your trust, and things like that. These are like very important things that we should do on a regular basis, either once a month, once a, I don't know, once a quarter, uh, every, every six months or maybe once a year. But for me, it's something I do every month. Uh, and at the end of the year, I have a financial meeting with my husband where we decide where our money for the year would go. So a yearly budget, and then we do a monthly checkup so to ensure that we are still on track. So in order for you to have where you are going to, like, okay, I'm fixing my eye on something, you need to have a goal. Without a goal, you are not going to, like, you are not going to be able to be disciplined enough to say, I want to do this. If you don't know where your savings, let's say you save at the end of the month, you don't know where that savings is supposed to go, then it is it's free, meaning you can just spend it. It means that you can just spend it and it doesn't matter. So having a goal in sight helps you fine tune how you are going to use your savings in the future. So for instance, the first kind of goal you can set is short-term goals like the emergency fund. What is an emergency fund? As the name implies, God forbid anything happens to you today. How are you going to survive? At least for the first six months or the first one year, depending on, of course, where you live. At least in course, Nigeria, we don't pay rent every six monthly. Now we pay rent yearly. So depending on where you are, you can adjust, you know, what your emergency fund will look like. So this fund is supposed to be saved in like accessible in a liquid form. So meaning in your savings that cannot be invested. Just so that in any case anything happens to you, you lose a job, you have losses in the stock market, or rather the stock market is going down and you have investment there, uh, blah, blah, blah. You are not going to go into more losses and go into more debt because you have this emergency fund that is going to be like a soft landing to you when life sometimes happens. Medium term goal could be buying a house or starting a business. So that could be maybe a five years from now. What do you want to do? Or I don't know, three years from now, what do you want to do with you know, the extra money after you've saved up your emergency fund? The extra money, now that money is money that you can use to take risk, meaning to invest, to buy a house, to do things that can bring more money. But the more risk you take, calculated risk, the, the benefit can be, can be great, could be great. And then long-term goal could be retirement. So every month you're saying, okay, I'm saving such and such amount in the stock market or in this place towards my retirement that it can grow steadily till the point where I would like to retire. So now we'll go to the spending plan. So I'm picking just two budget types. There are so many, you have the envelope type, you have the no budget budget, you have so many different types. So I'm just going to emphasize on two different types and then we'll go in depth into the zero sum budget. So percentage budgeting is when you allocate percentages to different uh, parts or categories of your, of your, of your well, I say life, 50%, like this 50, 30, 20 is not set on stone. Do you understand? You don't have to use 30% of your, of, your, of your income for leisure, for instance. You may decide to use only 10% of it for leisure. Maybe you are aggressively saving for something. So you can say, okay, maybe 50% can cover my expenses. Okay, that's fine. I have 50% extra. That 50%, I'm going to use 10% of it for leisure. And then 40%, I'm saving aggressively towards buying a house. I'm saving aggressively to build up my emergency fund very fast so that I can be able to have, you know, leeway. It doesn't mean that you have 0% for leisure. No, you can leave some because we are human beings. We need to enjoy our life as we go. Um, then zero-sum budget is when, like I said, you go through a fine-tooth comb. You are going through every category, assigning something to it and ensuring that you are sticking to it so that you can have consistent savings and you can be able to reach your any of the goals that we talked about previously very quickly. So this is a, a zero sum budget that I created. Um, it's simple, now that there are a lot of budgeting tools out there. I'm sure many of you have heard of different kinds of budgeting tools. Me, I like something that I can feel and touch and I can, you know, so like Excel, I'm doing it and I'm it's like sticking to my head. Like I'm not just leaving it to be automated. I, I just, I have to put the effort to do it so I know that it is moving. So that's just it. So here we have like the income part where you have your net salary or your side hustle, anything you are doing extra to bring in more income. And that would the sum of that will give you your disposable income. So the money you can actually spend. 
Now you have your mandatory expenses. Excuse me. On the mandatory expenses, you have your rent, you have your food, you have your transport, you have your utilities, you have your hygiene, things you use for yourself or for your house, your children's school fees, you have to pay for their school fees, your car insurance, and then any other item that is mandatory that you need to facilitate your daily life. That is mandatory. So that is mandatory expenses. And now you have your discretionary expenses. So like when you are buying your clothes or um, car repairs and maintenance, um, you have your parents and siblings, you want to send them money, um, donations, like I mentioned, if you want to give, you know, to the less fortunate, um, leisure, anything you want to put to leisure, your grooming, like your hair, you want to do your hair, you want to barb your hair for your children, for yourself. Miscellaneous is just anything maybe random that you just, you know, something that just come up very quickly that you just want to spend more money on. You can put it under that category. You have travel. So, for instance, me, I like to travel. I want to travel once a year to Nigeria, for instance. So, I will put the category there and say, okay, every month, let me be saving $300 so that at the end of the year, I would have saved enough money that would take me to Nigeria and come back and maybe be small money to still spend in between. So, Everything, your kids' college fund, for instance, let's say you have children and you want to ensure that when you get to retirement, you don't want, to, or when you're older, you don't want to start struggling on how to, you know, pay their school fees, when, especially when they get to college or university. So you're like, okay, let me be saving this amount and investing it in maybe in the in a particular fund or ETF or whatnot, so that by the time they get to 18, they can take that money out and be able to pay for their school fees without me having to stress myself so much. So that is you know, a long-term goal for your kids. Then you have maybe other things, like maybe Christmas gift, wedding, um, wedding gifts, or um, exchange of gift for Valentine, those kind of things. You can put it in the budget too, so that all those things you already have, um, you, you can look at it. So you can see that the budget is not something that is restricting your, spend, your, your spending. It's just telling you where you want the money to go. Now, if I don't want leisure anymore, I can cancel leisure and put that money towards my parents and siblings, for instance. Or I can cancel that leisure and put that money towards my savings. So it depends on how you want to do your budget. But I highly recommend that at least once in your life, you look at this kind of budget and you stick to it so that you can be able to master your habit. Now, if you have mastered your habit, you can now be able to put the 50, 30, 20 budget because you know how many percent of your income can, can go to mandatory expenses. So for the other ones, that time you may not be able to, you may not need to be going through the fight to find to come and looking at all the different categories. By then you would have mastered the budget so much so that you, you know, you can go through the other percentage budgets very easily. Now, this is like a tracker for your savings. So this is like an emergency fund tracker. So like from the previous slide, I, I think I, yes. So this, for instance, you have like potential savings from, from this particular example, this person will be able to save like $700 from their salary every month after they've taken into account all their expenses now they can decide to remove some of the expenses if they are aggressively saving for something so they can delete some of the discretionary discretionary expenses such that they can increase their savings so maybe they want to quickly build the emergency for maybe the emergency for this fifteen thousand, maybe six months of expenses and just to be tell you the emergency fund is all these mandatory expenses multiplied by six do you understand so at the end of the day, you want, okay, at the end of the day, I want 15000 in my emergency fund. This will be able to take care of us for six months. Should anything happen, loss of job, sudden, I don't know, sickness, whatever. You know, like, okay, this is what I want as my emergency fund. And this helps you track it. So month one, month two, month three, month four, month five. So that's it, month one, month two. So as you are putting it here, it would be showing, you understand? And you can, when you, when you feel it here, I think it automatically feels here. So it states that, oh, okay. This my stuff is in, increasing as it goes. And when you, and this is tracker. So this, this is where you want to be. This is where you currently are. Visually, you are seeing that, okay, you are making progress. That mentally helps us to be sort of, um, to have this um, adrenaline, not adrenaline, but this happiness that, oh, we are doing something for ourselves, at least for me. And then we can, let's, so that's the budget part of it. Sometimes we may not have enough income. That's the truth. Like, in fact, nobody claims to have enough income. <laughs> But at least if you're able to, you know, pay for your mandatory expenses, that's fine. But sometimes you might have income deficit. So some things that you can do to increase your income is upskill with training to increase your earning potential in your chosen field 
or another field. For example, me, I want to earn more. I always look to earn more. What did I do? I'm like, okay, maybe I can, and I, I know that I can work, you know, some things remotely. What did I do? I started studying to be a scrum master, even though in my current job, I'm a ma project manager uh, in the renewable energy sector, you know, for offshore substations. I'm like, okay, that one, I can do it like daily, but maybe in the evening, I can maybe see if I can get a job in the US as in a different time zone so that I can, you know, apply, the, I did the Scrum Master on Christmas Day, I got the Scrum Master certification because I'm like, okay, that's a different field, it's IT and it can be remote. So maybe that I can use to improve my potential. Now I'm currently looking for jobs in Scrum Master because now I have the certificate to be able to apply for those jobs. Or uh, learn a new skill like sewing, photography, digital marketing, sewing, for instance, for kids, all those tutu skirts, all those simple, you know, princess gowns that are not very intricate and all that. Me, myself, I'm looking for my daughter's birthdays around the corner. I've not seen to buy. So imagine that you are selling those and, you know, selling beautiful ones. People abroad are looking for those kind of um, those kind of things, but they are not seeing it very easily. Some of them have those resort to go back to Nigeria to get it or, you know, pay very expensive prices, you know where they live. So you can tap into that market, especially for kids. I'm saying for kids because you don't have to start measuring and you know knowing so many things. Screen it for kids will give you the leeway to be able to do for like different ages and you're not, you know, you don't have to be a master or whatnot. Uh, photography, for instance, when people give birth, they want to have nice picture, but sometimes, you know, like in France, they don't have those services very easily. So you can look around your area. Do people, you know, like the services? Most people do, most parents, they have two kids. Most parents do. So you can maybe either go to the, the, the what they call it, the hospitals or what, or the people or, you know, social media, whatnot, and offer services like, you know, for infant photography or portrait photography for families. It's something that you can learn and something that can bring you really good income or even digital marketing. So learning a new skill can help you increase your income so that you can, you know, have that side hustle that can, you know, increase how you can save and maybe start investing. Use your existing talent to generate more income for yourself. So, for instance, let's say you saw somebody that knows how to talk or someone that knows how to read, someone that knows how to, uh, I don't know, read dramatically. A lot of people on social media, what do they do? They get people's stories and read it dramatically. And they have engagements. They are not reading their story. They are not doing anything. They're just, because they know how to, you know, read and, you know, make it sound interesting, people follow them just to hear those gists. And it's not their story. They're just reading from maybe Reddit or from another platform. If you have that kind of skill, why not tap into it? Or, for instance, AI, leverage AI. There are a lot of tools that will help you if you go to ChatGPT and say, okay, please create a video for me for children on Montessori teaching or something. They will give you the roadmap. Then there's another AI tool that you can go to to say, okay, generate the actual video for me. And then you post it on YouTube and get passive income. So there are so many things that... Hello? Sorry, I'm hearing somebody speaking. Is there a question? Please be muted, please. Sorry. Okay. okay. So um learning um you're using your existing skill or you know leveraging on AI or what's whatever current trend is ongoing can help you make more income so that you can be able to now you know reach all those goals that you know financial goals that you have to go to. The introduction to investment. So I'll just touch this very quickly. Now, depending on the country that you live in, I'm going to focus on France because that's where I live. There are different ways you can invest. And where you live, you can actually look into the investment opportunities there, especially in the stock market. Now, I'm not a trader, so I'm not doing trading now. Some people make a lot of money from trading, but because I don't, I know I don't want to be actively involved in the stock market and I'm saving for retirement mainly. So I do not actively trade. What I do is that I invest through different um, vehicles like ETFs or actually actual stocks uh, that I keep for, for a long time and they generate, you know, they, they, at least most of my, my, my portfolio has seen significant increase. When I mean significant, I mean really significant increase since the pandemic. So what I'm saying is that where, where you live, you can look into the stock market there. For instance, in France, you have what they call PEA, the kind of account you can use to invest through. You have the, um, you have the um, CTO, is another way you can invest through by in, in buying stocks. You have your assurance V, which is another way that you can invest for even your kids. That one helps to actually secure your investment for your kids. So when you pass on, there is a certain amount of money your kids will not pay any tax on from your investment. So being able to look at where you live 
And at least for the stock market, you can get those inf information very easily online for where you live. Uh, if you guys were living in France, I'll be able to give you further information on how to invest in the stock market over here. But investing in the stock market is not as scary, but you must have an emergency fund. You must have other funds on the side so that even when the market is misbehaving, it doesn't concern you. In fact, your mindset is that whenever the stock market is going down, it's time for you to buy more because you know it will always go up. Following the trend, it, is, it will always go up at some point. Even after 2008, it still went up. People that sold were people that were not prepared for the market at the time. So if even if your the stock market is going down, you are buying more because you are buying it cheap. It will definitely go up eventually. So what I will urge you is in the city, in the country you live in, Germany, take some time because it's it's like I said, always seek knowledge. Take some time to go through how can you invest in ETFs. Maybe we can have another session completely on different kind of investments um, that may be available to you in the stock market, so that you know we can discuss on that on a different topic. Because I think I've taken a lot of time. <laughs> on this topic now you have to be accountable for your finance so make sure that you do a monthly financial checkup so either by yourself or with an accountability coach um yearly look back and look ahead so look back on the year like let's say at the end of 2024 look back on 2024 and plan for 2025 either by yourself or with an accountability accountability coach and if you want an accountability coach i kept my number here so you can be able to reach me via WhatsApp. So thank you very much for having me. And I hope maybe um, you have learned one or two things and um, I would give the, give back to, to Shego. Thank you so much. Um, we would. I said thank you so much. Have you? Can you stop? Um, have you stopped sharing your screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think we should remove the spotlight. Yeah. So over to you uh, for the question and answers. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for this. Um very insightful um, webinar. I mean, personally, my eyes have been open. <laughs> okay, and especially when you were talking about the wheel, uh, and knowing Nigerians, you know, that we are here, I'm sure many people are like, uh, <laughs> I'm not ready to die. But anyways, um, we already have some questions and like we put in the chat box, if you have questions, you can just click on the link and type in your questions. We have quite a few of them. And uh, what would you like? Should I read them out or you just read and would um, go through? Oh, okay. I can, I can read and we can go through here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the first one, please, what is your opinion about investment agents? Do you advise engaging investment agents or agencies to trade on your behalf? Um, like I said before, I am not a trader and it's not something I do encourage, except, of course, you have the time to really seek that knowledge. But most especially, nobody can, you, in fact, you're the CEO of your, your finance. That's why I see it. So in the beginning, it's good for you to know a lot about the investment, the trade and whatnot. And to have in mind that investing through investment agents, you are going to pay them a fee. And most of them are not even, they don't, they may not even have more knowledge than you. Do you understand? So for me personally, I never in my all my investment, I do them myself, myself, excuse me. And I never really engaged any um, investment agent to invest in the stock market for me. Now Trading is another topic because that is like gambling, you know. So the probability of you losing your money because you are buying and selling in a very short period of time. So the, the probability of you losing your money in that trade is, is quite high. So it's not something I encourage, but if you, you know, of course, we are free humans with free will. So maybe you, you want to, you know, master it and trade and, you know, you can absolutely do that. But I would advise that you do that on your own. 
So you because a lot of these uh, agencies they just have big names, but they are not um, they are not you know worth it, in my opinion. I'll go to the next one. How do I deal with spending on impulse? E.g., I see something I like, and I want to buy it immediately. Okay, I get this question. Now that is that means you have to restrict the um the amount of money that you are exposed to. Do you understand? So maybe for somebody like you, you maybe it's maybe having envelope method of of spending, meaning that you have your envelope. In many money, maybe you can put it in a fixed deposit or something that you cannot access, so that the money that you have in front of you is the money that you can see. That fixed deposit is there. I mean, you cannot break it. You know, it is maybe for six months or something. So you cannot break it. So if even if you see something you like right now, you want to buy it. You can't because you have the only money you have in your hand is what you can use to live daily. And if you don't, if you don't, you know, apportion it properly, you are going to starve. So maybe somebody like that that is, you know, into impulse spending, you can maybe use the envelope method where you withdraw physical cash and you put it in envelope to say, okay, this is for food, this one is for this. Then for the things that you cannot, you know, use physical cash for, like maybe your rent, you have to transfer, you just put the exact amount that you need. So the one that you transfer, like utilities and all that, will be the exact amount you have to transfer and pay those companies. And the remaining money, you have to lock it up. You have to lock it up because if not, you would not be. And then with time, you'll be able to work on your impulse spending and you'll be able to, you know, recognize that delayed gratification is very important when you want to build wealth. The next question, what is your take about taking loans to sponsor personal projects? Do you advise to rent or buy a house, particularly in Europe? Ah, my dear, to be honest with you, I'm not really a loan person. Honestly, I'm not somebody who would encourage loans because of the interest that you have to pay, except, of course, the personal projects that when you say personal projects, I'm trying to understand, is it going to school? Is it, I mean, it's different things. For me personally, I, I, don't, I don't really like loans, except, of course, the mortgage that you need to take to buy a house. But anything else that I am not sure that would bring proper return that is not you know guaranteed that that return is going to come i am really skeptical about loans to be honest i prefer that i for instance i give you an example when i came to france i came to france to study why did i come to france but well, it was cheap like if i wanted to by force go to the uk i would have paid maybe twenty thousand pounds for my master's degree that was i mean eight years ago but i chose to come to france because it was six thousand euros so the personal project sometimes is good for you to um, look for options that you can maybe have cheaper options that you can be able to fund by yourself or save for a period of time so that you can be able to fund those projects. But taking out loans and not being able to pay those loans back would only put you more in debt and coming out of that may not be so easy. So it's not something I truly encourage. Do you advise to rent or buy a house, particularly in Europe? Now, it depends on how long you want to stay in that area. It depends on how what are your plans. Now, if, for instance, you are uh, determined that, okay, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be here for the long haul, definitely buy. Definitely buy. But if it's a place that is in transit, meaning, oh, yeah, your eye is still outside, maybe you know that in the next two years or next three years, you are going to move to, I don't know, uh, another country or another place, then it is not worth buying because at the end of the day, all the costs that's associated in buying a house, people don't never really talk about all the closing costs and when you sell out, so many things, the markets, how the market will look like, anything you do not know. So for a very short period of time, if you are going to stay in that place not too long, then renting may just be more worthwhile than, than buying. Um, how should I balance protecting my plan and unexpected demands from my family? Now, that's what, where you have boundaries. That's where you have boundaries because at the end of the day, um, there's a way you give, you yourself will become broke. To be honest, I, we all have Nigerian families. We all understand these things. At some point, you have to put boundaries on your plan, meaning you have to know how much you can truly give that will not deter you from where you are going to eventually. That's one of the things I said. 
uh, in my in my in my stuff. Sometimes you can be able to give your family um, the the in fact way, the way to fish, not the fish itself. So paying for them to go for a program, let's say, let's say you have or going for something to even if they are in school, something else that can generate income for them that they can be doing that can be bringing income for them. That's by so doing, you are empowering them and then relieving yourself for, 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 for the future. So you have to apply boundaries. Like I said, your, your, your spending plan is like your, is like your bread and butter. So you have to be very disciplined about it and to ensure that people, demands will always, always come. But at some point, you, you may not be able to meet those demands. And if you give everything you have, at some point, even if they bring demands, you won't be able to meet those demands and your own demands are suffering. So you have to learn to have boundaries and be able to apportion the amount that you can afford in your, in your, in your budget and communicate that, see, not like you're communicating the amount, but you said, see, I can only afford to a certain level. After this, I don't have. And that is it. Um, the next one, saving for retirement versus private pension. What does that mean? What do you mean by saving for retirement versus private pension? I'm not sure I understand the question. But if, anyways, for me, I, I in, the, in France, when you are working, the state, you are paying pension generally. So meaning that at a, at set, at a certain age, you would be able to have entitlement to their quote and unquote social security, security social. However, on the side, I am investing in a, an account called PEA, which is tax advantaged. And in that tax advantaged account, you can be able to save up to a certain amount of money that can help you build wealth. So looking for several different avenues on your own personally that you can invest beyond what, for instance, in Nigeria, you have like Stambic IBTC, they are investing for you. But you on your own can have a separate investment for yourself because you don't know how much that Naira will be worth in 20 years time or 30 years time. You may decide to be saving or investing in a different currency. That's if you live in Nigeria, such that you are able to secure your finances. For example, when I was in Nigeria several years ago, I had in mind to, that's one thing about discipline. I'm going to give this thing. One, one thing about this discipline. I Several years ago, I thought to myself, this was 2010, that, oh, I should be saving my Naira money, money I'm earning from my job, in dollars. I went ahead to GT Bank. I opened domiciliary account. What did I not do? I didn't go to the Aboki to change it to dollars. And then dollars was 155 Naira to $1. Can you imagine how much that money would have been just by sitting down, just by making that move? in that time. So this is what discipline and following through. The, the amount of money I've lost to opportunity cost is very huge. So saving for retirement versus private pension, I don't really understand the question, but I'm only going to say that on the side, beyond whatever pension your company is doing, you should have something on the side, depending on the lifestyle you want to live in retirement. What is your take on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? I am. Um, I feel it's speculative. I feel it is not, um, is like now, you know, like it's too risky, is from, in my opinion, it's too risky. It is really speculative. Um, so I don't, it's not something I invest in, quite frankly. It's not something I invest in at all. I feel it's not, uh, because I don't, I, I don't understand it. And one of the things I, I said, I've tried to understand it, I've read extensively on it, and I still don't get it. I still don't get how the value is. At least when you are investing in the stock market, there are companies that are doing like Coca-Cola that are doing products that is being sold, Apple that is as a product behind it. But cryptocurrency is only increasing and decreasing based on pure speculation without having like the backbone of the company's you know, strength. So it's not something I invest in. It's not something I, I advise you know, people to invest in. But I mean, to each his own. Anybody, you have the autonomy to choose where you want to put you know, crypto, if you want to have cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, but personally, it's too speculative for me and I do not in invest in such. And then the last one I think is for Shegun. Can we have the rec recorded webinar? Um, yes, yeah, so this, this webinar is being recorded and um, it would be made available um, on our YouTube channel. 
So we are going to communicate uh, more on that uh, afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Patricia. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Um, yeah, so we've actually come to the end of the program. And before we go, I just want to talk about FON in general. And for that, I'll just share my screen. I know some of you will be asking, um, what's FON? Um, um, have we officially introduced um, ourselves and so on and so forth? I think I shared this um, this webinar to a lot of, of my WhatsApp groups so we can actually profit, profit from this program. So just a brief introduction of FON. Um, FON is a non-profit organization. It's, it, it was actually um, started in France and it's kind of broadened, broadened to Europe. So now we have FON France, we have FON Germany, we have FON Belox, that's um, Belgium and Luxembourg. We have FON, um, I think we're just actually broadening ourselves in general. Um, so why, um, what's the use, what's our aim in FON? We're actually looking to facilitate Nigerian professionals in Europe to business and professional developmental development opportunities. So once you come into FON, just like how Patricia mentioned some business opportunities like making clothes, digital marketing, when you have your companies, you can profit from this wide network of Nigerian professionals in Europe. And we also aim to promote Nigeria's attractiveness to French and European companies and investors. So we try to encourage, um, try to foster the partnership of you know, businesses, companies, so on and so forth with the Nigerian professionals ourselves. And we also try to facilitate um, opportunities between companies and Nigerians that have businesses and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's just basically what FON is all about. So I'll be pasting the link um, of FON Germany in the what's in the chat in the chat group. Sorry. Um, so if you are interested in joining, you can actually just fill the form. Um, the form will be pasted in the WhatsApp group. You can fill the form and you'll be included in our WhatsApp group. And in this WhatsApp group, we're a group whereby we have the committee of FON in, in, in general from the you can get connected to FON France, FON. Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we are building the largest network of Nigerian professionals in Europe. That's our aim. That's our vision. And, you know, we want to start here, start small and grow, you know, grow to, to an extent such that businesses can come and get linked up through us. You know, we can actually foster, you know, investments with, with companies, with even the government. So that's our aim in general. Yeah, so I believe the form has been posted in the WhatsApp group. Can you see my screen? I think probably. No, no, we can't. No, I don't know. If okay. I... We can see the FON uh, slide. That's what we can see. Uh, okay. Oops. Um, yeah, I'm actually sharing the FON slide. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see the FON yeah. slide. Yeah, so that's basically what um FON is all about. I'll be posting the WhatsApp, the chats. Sorry, I'll be posting the link to join the group in the chats, in the chat, in the Zoom chats. And afterwards, I'll just look into including us into the WhatsApp group. Yeah, thank you so much, Patricia, for um, the insightful insightful event and educational program. And I would like to say, Patricia shared her contact details after the program. I think we'll also post it in the, in the chat group because I saw someone asked in the chat group for Patricia's um, contact details. Yeah, I think that's all from my end. Um, I'll hand over to finalize the event.
yeah, so Shagan, could you please take over? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you again, and um, I we we have come to the end of this webinar, and um, this is our first event for twenty twenty four. Um, we have we're going to be having quite a couple of things. Uh, we'll be engaging you. Uh, we would really want to ask that you please engage, also engage with F O N Germany. Um, also, we'll be looking at having like a main event sometimes later in the year. We'd, we're going to send out more communication on that. Uh, for the most part, our activities are majorly um, online, and then also we're building a network. And so part of the also part of the advantage of uh, FON generally, and also being a part of um, FON Germany, is that you have opportunity to have cross collaboration cross collaboration across countries, across different uh, networks and different groups. Um, because of time, uh, we maybe did not go into the depth of some of the things that we do. We have also major events. Um, one of our main events is something called Spotlight Nigeria, where we spotlight businesses, we spotlight professionals, things that people are doing, Nigerians are doing uh, in the diaspora. Uh, and we would just want to encourage you to be on the lookout for us, be on the lookout for FON as an organization and particularly FON uh, Germany as a chapter. And to the next event, we want to say thank you. And also, I guess uh, Choma has shared the link uh, for people to register if you want to uh, be a part of uh, FON Germany for us to add you to the group and to the community, please, uh, you can register, um, kindly help us share the, the link. And also, you can also even follow us on our Andus, our social media platforms, uh, on LinkedIn, on uh, on Instagram, also on Twitter. Uh, it's a, we're trying to build also a very uh, defined uh, target group. And so that's why we're asking people to register and for people to indicate their interest, because we believe that this should be something that it's a very targeted and uh, elite group of people, and then we can do quite great things uh, together. So thank you so much, and uh, we will see you at the next uh, event or at the next time where we bring everyone together. And so also, finally, people have asked if we are going to share the recording of this event. Uh, this event was being recorded. And um, so we are going to share it on our YouTube uh, page. We would communicate that also uh, in due course. Thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, Saturday and the rest of the weekend. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend. Yeah.